Hello, my name is Dr. Lisa Corbin, and I'm here today to talk to you a little bit about what you can do as a licensed professional counselor or an LPC, as well as what you can do with your 60 credit master's degree in counseling or clinical mental health. And so just a little bit about me, like I had shared, I'm Dr. Lisa Corbin. I did just earn my PhD in counselor education and supervision. I am also a licensed professional counselor and a nationally certified counselor. I'm gonna get into each of these different titles and what they mean in a little bit. But for right now, I thought I'd share a little bit about me and my career path because I talk quite a bit about all of these different opportunities and things you can do with your 60 credit master's degree. So one is that I've worked on college campuses for over 20 years. And I know you're probably looking at me and thinking, but you're so young. Well, yes, I started when I was 10. Just kidding. I actually started very early on working uh, for different college campuses, and I worked in various um, fields and various aspects of college campuses that I'm going to talk to you a little bit about in a little bit. I also um, served as a sexual assault advocate on college campuses. I'm a rape crisis counselor in both Pennsylvania and New York. And I run groups for males who are survivors of childhood sexual abuse. I did my master's internship at an inpatient facility and ended up working for them for about 10 years um, at an inpatient facility for men or people in recovery, particularly men, males in recovery. And at this facility, I actually began to have some specialty areas um, to impact in fact, one of them would be um, grief and loss. And then the other was meditation and mindfulness. And I found a lot of people coming into the facility really needed a way to ground themselves, but that they were also suffering from many different losses, not just people, but maybe their children to the, you know, to the system, maybe themselves. So the grief and loss really played out in a way that allowed me to practice there, but then also make that a specialty in my private practice. So I do have a small private practice outside of my full-time job here at PCOM. And um, I use my license as a professional counselor to, um, for my private practice, I should say. And it's only about five or six clients that I see, but they keep me busy and I'm able to use a lot of those um, client stories and bring them into the classroom for sure. Also some fun things that I've done over the past 20 years or so. Um, I was a New York State certified mediator. I worked for Villanova University and became a ropes course facilitator, which I helped people build their teams and did some team building activities. I also served as a field placement coordinator at an institution where I oversaw about 140 people out on practical and internship each year. And then I was an adjunct instructor, moved my way up to associate or assistant professor, and then became the director. And then I also served as an academic advisor. So I used my counseling degree in many different various ways. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about each of them. But now let me tell you about my three passions. So my three passions are teaching, supervising, and counseling. So for me, when I thought, what do I want my full-time position to be? and I realized I really wanted to be a full-time faculty job, I realized I had to move on and get my PhD. And I chose the PhD in counselor education and supervision because it met all three of my needs and my passions, counseling, educating, and supervising. Also, um, as you'll hear my story, as we talk about um, consultation and collaboration, I actually started here at PCOM as a consultant. So hold off on that for a little bit, but for sure. And this statistic comes out pre-COVID and pre-COVID, um, I don't think that the mental health field was really um, doing as good of a job as we are right now of trying to debunk the stigma surrounding mental health, as well as to realize mental health really needs to be paid more attention to. I'm thinking of two incidences. One is we are in Philadelphia, as you know, and um, we do have a player on the 76ers right now who's talking quite a bit about his mental health and how it's keeping him from being able to play on the court. We also have um, a lot of Olympians who are coming out and talking about their mental health 
and what toll that has taken on them as they become these Olympians. So I think for sure, between the stress of COVID, athletes and other famous people stepping forward and saying mental health needs to be addressed, I think that this statistic is going to go up even more. But as it stands, as of right now, the Bureau of Labor Statistics projected career outlook for mental health counselors is expected to expand by approximately 29% from 2012 to 2022. So there are absolutely going to be jobs out there for counselors and clinicians. We just have to figure out what types are of interest to use. Let me talk a little bit about all you can do with this degree. And for sure, some of you might be in the same boat I'm in, where you say, you know what, I like counseling, but I don't want to make that my full-time job. I'd like to go on. So you can always go on for your MD or DO in psychiatry. You could for sure get your PhD and you can go in, um, get the PhD in psychology. You can get the PhD in clinical psychology. You could get the PhD in counselor education and supervision and become a counselor educator. Some people choose to go on for the pure PsyD, which is a lot of clinical work, where you talk quite a bit about um, assessments and instruments and diagnosing. You could maybe use some of your social advocacy passions and go on and get your JD and work in the legal system. Some folks will use this counseling piece and say, you know what, I'm more uh, in tune with the body and I want to go on to medical school in some way. And they might choose to become a nurse practitioner or a physician's assistant. Also, another opportunity for a lot of folks, they say, hey, you know what, I've done the counseling for, I don't know, let's say five, 10, eight, whatever, however many years. And they say, but I really want to become a director. And some employers will say, great, we see, we know that you have the clinical piece down for sure. What we're looking for is somebody who can manage the business side as well. So they might require you to go on for your MBA and maybe you can become a CEO of a mental health agency. Some folks who are um, trying to build a large private practice, they might also go on for an MBA and learn the business side of things as well. Either way, um, it's up to you and you really have to think about what are your passions. And then along with this, you can always go on and get a certificate. So sometimes students will say, um, I really, I have my addictions concentration like we have here at PCOM, but I want to get the certificate that goes along with it. Fortunately, our students are eligible for that certificate in addictions. Um, and you can find out more about that on, the, on our website. Other people say, you know what, I want to go on and I want to do a gender diversity certificate or a gero psych certificate or a trauma certificate. You can get those through various organizations. You just have to look them up and realize what is your passion for sure. All right, so now I'm going to talk to you a little bit just about the counseling profession overall. So for sure, if you have a 60 credit master's degree in counseling, you can become a counselor in various different settings. You can do inpatient, outpatient, intensive outpatient, halfway houses, residential treatment facilities. Those run the gamut. As we'll see, community organizations you can go into. And that's the setting. And then the different agencies you can work with, veterans. What we're seeing more and more of in the schools is yes, there are school counselors. And to become a school counselor, you need that certificate as a school counselor. So we're also seeing a lot of schools say, you know what, along with that, we're going to have a mental health counselor in the school. Those positions do not require you to have that school counseling certificate. You just need to become a licensed professional counselor, and then you can work in the school and bill independently. Also, uh, as counselors, you could for sure work in a hospital. You could do telehealth or telemedicine, phone counseling. You could work in a private agency. You could work um, in a private practice, whether it be your own, like what I have, a few clients on the side, or you can join a private practice where they will get you the clients, they will help you do the billing, uh, and then they take a portion of what you would be charging the person. Here at PCOM, one of the things that we pride ourselves in is this integrated health and integrated counseling. So um, for sure, I think we're seeing more and more of this coming up, but I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. But with your counseling degree, you could for sure um, use these skills as an integrated healthcare worker in various settings, whether it be 
um, your primary care physician's office or hospitals or outpatient facilities. Also, counselors get specialized training in group counseling and running support groups, so you could definitely do something like that. Foster care and adoptions, religious centers, prisons, courthouses, correctional facilities, these are all places that counselors can work. Nursing homes, recruitment, intakes and evaluations. So we've had a couple of alumni come back to us and say, you know what? The counseling can be too heavy for me at times. So I think I need to go on a journey, a personal journey for myself, where I'm able to work through uh, maybe something going on for me personally, but look what I'm able to do. I'm still able to do a good intake and um, do some evaluations for places full time or part time and go on my personal journey, maybe come back to the counseling piece or not. It's up to you. And then career counseling and juvenile justice centers. We'll talk a little bit more about both of those as we go throughout this presentation. But I'm hoping as you're seeing with this 60 credit master's degree in clinical mental health, you can do so much in so many different places. And then like I had just shared about that MBA, one of the things that um, you could do after you get a couple of years under your belt usually or typically, you could go and become a program manager or a program coordinator, director, whatever title you wish to use here. Um, this works really well for people like me who like to cross things off of their list, who like the administrative tasks, who like feeling a sense of accomplishment that doesn't always come with being a counselor because remember for counselor, you're doing long-term uh, change versus program administrators and directors, they can usually cross things off of their lists at the end. And anyone who knows me knows that I like my color coding and my lists. So for sure, um, you could work your way up to a program director position in a clinical setting where you're able to kind of do a little bit of both. Usually you'll see a few clients, but then you'll also oversee and supervise other counselors. And as I had shared, um, I think this is my 22nd year working in higher education. So you can for sure work in higher education or educational settings in general. Because remember, career centers hire career counselors. You take a whole course in your master's program working on um, career centers and college and career counseling. So you'd be able to use that knowledge if you worked in higher education at a career center doing resume reviews, helping people decide what is the career for me? What's the good fit for me? Um, you can also work in counseling centers on college campuses, health education. We have an alumni who is doing exactly that. She um, works for a college, a local college or university, and she does a lot of health education. So the other day she had reached down to me and saying she was choosing all, all in denim. And she's like, this is the best part of my, actually she sent me a picture and she said, this is the best part of my job because it was um, breast cancer awareness month and it was wear denim day. And she was in this, you know, this jumper that was a denim jumper. Um, she's told me that she has gone out and done depression screenings. She's educated people on healthy relationships, on domestic violence, whatever the um, theme is for that month. That you can do that with a, count, a 60 credit counseling degree for sure, especially on a college campus or at a community organization. Also, um, I started in residence life. So I became a resident director and then assistant director of residence life and then eventually um, the assistant vice president for student affairs at a college. And I worked in residence life. I oversaw about 400 first year students and maybe about 45 um, RAs or resident assistants. I was able to use my counseling degree at times, use some of that administrative uh, education that I have, as well as really just progress students along in their journey, their college journey. You could work for a Head Start agency or boarding schools or charter schools. You could become an educational advisor. All of these different opportunities are available to anybody with their 60 credit master's degree. And then yes, for sure, you can with your master's degree and your 60 credit master's degree in counseling, you can become an adjunct and you can do some guest lecturing. And I usually say if you, this is something that you're interested in, if you want to become an adjunct, I always say start out guest lecturing. 
find, contact your um, alma mater, contact some friends or people you know, say, hey, can I come in and do a presentation on whatever your specialty is? Come into the classroom, put that on your resume because that tells me as the hirer, hmm, they know how to manage a classroom, they know what strategies might work. Now, if you are interested in teaching full-time, typically you do have to have a PhD or a PsyD in order to hold a full-time uh, faculty position. But again, you can always become an adjunct. I usually say not just starting with the guest lecturing, but then you can always go. Um, community colleges are always looking for someone to teach their Psych 101 courses or to teach those first year experience courses. They're always looking for people, so you can always look into doing that. And then I had just shared with you the health educator positions. Um, I talked to you a little bit about the health educator positions on a college campus, but I'll tell you, we have some alumni who are working for community agencies doing health education in the schools and in the community at, at YMCAs and churches. All of this is available to you. And these are full-time or part-time jobs. I think really it's, what, what is it that you want? Do you want a full-time, part-time, half-time, whatever position? Um, you can always negotiate it. And then for sure, here at PCOM, one of the things we pride ourselves in is helping our students learn how to work with other medical and helping professionals. So for sure, you could work in an outpatient cl uh, clinic, and maybe you were helping some of the primary care physicians' patients um, with their adherence to, um, to medicine or to taking care of themselves. You can bring in your areas of expertise to the field and help those people who are trying to decrease their risk of diabetes or manage their diabetes, let's say, you can help them by using your motivational interviewing and trying to help them become adherent to some of the suggestions that um, their primary care physician is offering. You could also work in an inpatient hospital or a standalone crisis center or a mobile crisis unit. As you know, many of these mobile crisis units will go out into the community and then help people transition into the medical setting or the hospital. So you can be the liaison between the hospital and the client. You can work in an emergency department. And then some of the specialty cares um, that uh, we have some students doing two different things here. One of them is doing, um, she's working with folks who are choosing to have that bariatric surgery and meeting with them to make sure that they are ready for that surgery and that life change. And again, using motivational interviewing, using their counseling skills to help people realize that they probably are ready for these um, surgeries. And then we have someone else over in New Jersey who is um, working with, um, um, primary care physicians who have their specialty area as fertility and surrogacy. And she's helping people adjust to becoming families, screening people to make sure that they're ready to go through this journey of trying to have a baby. Again, think outside of the box sometimes. And then absolutely for counseling, um, one of the things that we do is we teach our counselors to advocate for themselves, for their clients, for their communities and for the profession. So that's a whole nother area that counselors can go out and work in where you can become an advocate and you can hold a full-time or part-time or half-time job working for um, the government or working for the state. Um, for instance, the Pennsylvania Counseling Association has an advocate and a liaison who works with the state trying to get past what it is that we need to get past that year. Uh, for instance, one year it was diagnosing rates and we were able to get that passed through the Pennsylvania Counseling, uh, I'm sorry, the Pennsylvania Senate. You could also become an advocate for a local mental health agency um, or a national one. We have a, uh, an alumni who is working for NAMI right now, and she's trying to decrease stigma. She's doing a little bit of research, a lot of bit of health education and promotion. So it really is what is your interests and what is it that you want to do with them? Do you want them to put them in the back burner? Do you want to make them first and foremost, part-time, half-time, whatever it might be? Also, I'll tell you, um, community outreach and advocacy, those two go hand in hand for sure. You could do trainings, health fairs, speaking to schools, churches, or organizations. Whenever people say to me, how did you build up your private practice? That's how I did it. In the beginning, I would go out to schools and churches and do some free um, lectures or workshops. And then people would say, hey, can I get your card? Hey, I like you. They're my, or I know somebody who might benefit from your services. 
community outreach for sure. And then I'm sure that you saw that overall umbrella of what you can do with your counseling degree and you're realizing you could go and work in a shelter or a church. Sometimes people will say, hey, I don't have a job right now. And I always say to them, go out and volunteer. Go, find a church, find a shelter, find somewhere where you can really get to know people, increase your, um, your diversity knowledge and awareness. So you can work in a school, a, a camp, or a sports or recreation facility. And then while some people are really turned off by working with insurance agencies, I always say, hey, keep in mind, we need good people on those boards as well. So a lot of insurance companies now, what they're doing is they're hiring clinicians, especially those who have a license, and are asking those folks, hey, you know the field best. You are on the other side of this, so come on board. We want you to review and approve claims or maybe any request for an extension of care, do some chart um, reviews or auditing. And some insurance companies are even hiring people to work like 24 seven phone counselors to kind of assess what level of care does the caller need? Do they need to go to outpatient, inpatient, IOP, whatever it might be. And then you heard my three passions, right? Counseling, educating, and supervising. So the supervision piece I actually do on the side where I supervise people who are sitting for their licensure. And um, that's how I make a little bit of side money here. I do it on the side, it's my area of specialty. Again, I have specialized training in it. And um, so you could do that. Once you have your license for a while, you just have to check the state regulations to make sure that you qualify. Or a lot of times it, having the LPC makes you very marketable because the site will say, great, we no longer have to pay this outsider to come in and supervise our counselors seeking licensure, you can do that because you have the LPC. And then yes, you heard me make mention of research a little bit with the NAMI job. Keep in mind, research isn't just sitting there crunching numbers. For instance, we have uh, an alumni who is working for a pharmaceutical company right now, and she is conducting interviews and facilitating focus groups. And then she's taking in that qualitative data and she's writing it out for people so that they can better their market and that they can better their product that they're delivering. Obviously, yes, one of the things you've learned how to do in, in your research class during your master's program was to create a valid and reliable survey. So for sure, some places will hire you to crunch that data or to look at this data and say, is it really measuring what we wanted to measure? Is it valid? Is it reliable? Um, but these are up to you. Research does not have to be just data crunching. Although many times people say, you know what? I like that aspect of it too. Again, I like to cross things off my list. This is something that is of interest to me. So I always say, you know what? Um, for fun, search, Google search. Do a Google search and say research jobs near me. It'll be, I think you'd be surprised as to what comes up. And then I shared with you, I started here um, being a consultant. And uh, in particular, what I was doing was I was evaluating the program here at PCOM. And um, I did that with quote unquote, just my master's degree. And then I ended up earning my PhD along the way. So you can absolutely become a program evaluator or a consultant. And it looks different in, in whatever aspect that it is that you're hired for. For instance, somebody might bring you on and say, we would love for you to evaluate our program. And you're able to kind of do some focus groups. You're able to see what else is going on out there. Or they might want you to say, they say, hey, you know what? We're in um, the school setting. We have this client who has experienced some pretty significant trauma. What is it that we could do? How can we help this client be the best that they can be in our setting? So that's another way that you can become a consultant. Um, also, sometimes people will reach out to me and say, you know, I have this client and I just kind of need someone to supervise me as I work through this client. I also supervise people on their supervision. So again, this consultation, collaboration, and program evaluation, you probably took a course on this, and I'll tell you, it runs the gamut. I always tell people, be creative, find out what it is that's um, new and upcoming, but then try to uh, figure out a way to get yourself into that field if that's, that's what you're all about. 
And then here are some miscellaneous things that I thought of for you folks. Um, I have a friend of mine down in Texas and how, you know, her side hustle is what she calls it. And what she does for her side hustle here is she will write a blog for a, um, it's Black Women's Mental Health, Texas Black Women's, something along those lines. And um, she gets paid just a little bit, but she loves it. She's finding that it is one way for her to keep up with her writing skills, for her to do some advocacy. Um, some people choose to do a blog or a journal magazine, whatever it is, but sometimes you can make it into a full-time gig. Other times, I think it's, it is what it is. It can be just a side job for you. Something else that's coming up more and more, these medical and health service managers, they make a decent amount of money for sure. Um, we have a couple of alumni who have gone into hospital settings and helped um, doctors with their clinical skills or their basic counseling skills and taught them how to you know, engage in basic counseling. We have a faculty member here on our, on our faculty who has created a few apps. So for sure, if, if apps and technology is your thing, or even if counseling is your thing, but you're realizing, wow, I really wish we had an app that did this, um, you can go always go and create an app. Pharmaceutical companies, like I had mentioned, we actually have a couple of students who are working for pharmaceutical companies. One of them, she's like, you know, all I'm doing or just doing is um, selling a product. And I said to her, but you're still helping and you're using your counseling skills because you're using your person skills that we've taught you. And then for sure, you can always work in human resources. I always tell people, look at those different jobs, what they entail. You might be someone who could do trainings, somebody else who might work on compliance, but you can use your degree to work in human resources religious facilities or um, military facilities as well. And then for sure, a lot of times people say, all right, I'm about to graduate, what should I do? And I always say, hey, you've heard of YOLO? Well, I always say, yo, yo, so you're only young once. Go do what you wanna do. You can go travel. Um, one student said, I'm gonna become a stay-at-home parent. I said, awesome for you. You're certainly gonna use the counseling skills both on your children and yourselves and your, your um, support system for sure. Uh, you can always go and volunteer. Like I said, when you volunteer at places, you learn different skills. They usually pay for you to get some type of a certification. We have a couple of alumni who have done the um, suicide text line or the suicide hotline, and you get a certificate along the way. You get some great experience. You know how to deal with crises. You can then use that to get yourself a full-time job if that's what you're interested in. We've had other students go into uh, AmeriCorps or Teach for America and Peace Corps completely up to you what is that is of interest to you and what it is that you want to do but there are these non-traditional ways to get there too and I think I've talked quite a bit about some of my advice for you but I'm just going to say a few things here one is keep in touch with your your colleagues um, they will become your keep in touch with your classmates because they will become your colleagues I do a supervision group once every two months with my two peers from my doc program and we just talk about clients and try to figure out what's the best way to help them. And that relationship formed in our practicum and internship class where I said, hey, I really like what you had to say. They said the same to me. And so we formed this group for each other. Network as much as you can. Get to know people, use people. I think LinkedIn is a great resource for people. Um, something else I tell students all the time is to get involved. Join the Pennsylvania Counseling Association or join your state counseling association or um, join the Greater Philadelphia Area Counseling Association to which I happen to be the president for this year. These are organizations that will help you get in the know, get to know people. Usually if you're a part of the organization, you can attend their trainings and workshops for, and conferences for free and you get to just keep it's not very time demanding usually, and you get to keep in the loop as to what's going on in the field of counseling. Do a presentation or a lecture for someone, get your name out there, um, volunteer like I had just shared, take some risks, apply for jobs that are, they might seem a little bit of a far stretch, still apply to them. If they sound interesting to you and you feel like you have the skills, apply. You can always learn along the way. And sometimes people don't realize all that counselors can do until you get into the job interview. And then you can say, hey, here's what it is that I'm able to do. 
And then, yes, if you're watching this and you think, you know what, I don't have my um, master's degree in counseling yet, but that is something I'm interested in, please reach out to my friends over in the admissions office. In particular, our liaison is Jonathan Cox, and um, his contact information is on this slide. They can tell you a bit about the application process. They can tell you about the different programs that we offer here at PCOM. And then if you have questions in particular um, for the MS program here at PCOM, this is a picture of myself and my team. Um, there's one more who's gonna get onto that slide soon, but for sure, if you have program specific questions, please feel free to reach out. Uh, and if you're interested in sitting in on a class, you can call uh, Melanie Fields at the number on the bottom of the screen. She will help you to come sit in on a class if you're interested in learning a little bit more about PCOM and all that it is that we have to offer. Otherwise, I hope that you were able to enjoy this presentation and hopefully I'll see you soon. Take care.